dignitaries ladies and gentlemen a very good afternoon to everyone on behalf of imc chamber of commerce and industry i extend a warm welcome to the online interaction on multi pronged strategies to rebuild tourism and travel organized by imc's travel tourism and hospitality committee a very special thanks and welcome to our moderator mr mandeep lamba president south asia hvs anarok and guest speakers ms rupendra brar irs additional director general tourism ministry of tourism government of india mr sijit vich jaksono director of tourism marketing east south central asia ministry of tourism and creative economy republic of indonesia ms kemar lee fernando <clears throat> chairperson sri lanka tourism mr nishan kashikar country director india and gulf tourism australia mr cc suram pan director tourism authority of thailand and mr rohit kosla executive vice president operational north west india the indian hotels companies limited for sparing their valuable time and being with us today the event is being organized with the support of the indian hotels company limited and concept hospitality private limited the fun hotels and resorts i also take this opportunity to acknowledge bw Com communities as our esteemed media partners for the event around the world in countries at all development levels many millions of jobs and businesses are dependent on a strong and thriving tourism sector tourism has been the driving force in protecting natural and cultural heritages preserving them for future generations to enjoy as per wttc during 2019 contribution by travel and tourism to india's gdp was 6.8% of the to of the total economy and supported 39.8 million jobs which is almost 8% of our total employment the devastating impact of the covid-19 pandemic on the global tourism has carried on into 2021 with new data showing an 87% fall in international tourism arriving in january as compared to 2020 the outlook for the rest of the year remains cautious as the world tourism organization continues to call for stronger coordination on travel protocols between countries to ensure the safe restart of tourism and avoid another year of massive losses for the sector india is one of the most digitally advanced traveler nations in terms of digital tools being used for planning booking and experiencing a journey india's rising middle class and increasing disposable income has supported the growth of domestic and outbound tourism however with the a recent fresh surge of coronavirus infection has put once again the hospitality and tourism industry under renewed stress which was just beginning to feel optimistic about business prospects with the rollout of the vaccination drive revenue is less than 50% of the pre covid times and footfalls are declining we need to ensure that the hospitality and tourism industry in future is future ready to tap all the potential growth opportunities and also to safeguard its against all kinds of crisis situation including natural disasters and pandemics the objective of today's interaction is to have leaders from the travel and tourism industry from india australia indonesia sri lanka and thailand to have a dialogue and share their learnings and measures taken by each nation to rebuild tourism and enhance regional coordination for a sector that is going through its darkest hours in recent history we at imc are confident that today's online interaction would be beneficial to the travel tourism and hospitality community as this crisis is an opportunity to rethink tourism for the future tourism is at a crossroad and the measures put in place today will reshape the tourism for tomorrow government across the world need to consider the longer term implications of on the crisis while capitalizing on digitalizing 
supporting the low carbon transition and promoting the structural transformation needed to build a stronger and more sustainable and resilient tourism tourist economy the travel and tourism industry has gone through a crisis before and fought back the truth is that the pandemic is temporary and shall pass however it would lead to shaking up the industry with consolidation synergization and innovation being the new mantra we have no doubt that the sector will bounce back stronger and play an important role in our economic growth and development before i end a few words about imc established in 1907 and having its headquarters in the heart of the city of mumbai the imc chamber of commerce and industry is an apex chamber of commerce trade and industry having a member base of over 5000 members and 150 as- associations affiliated to it together it represents and advocates the interests of over 4 lakh businesses and industry establishments across the country from diverse sectors of industry i once again welcome you all to this insightful session Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Puttar. I now request Mr. Farhad Jamal, Chairman, IMC Travel, Tourism and Hospitality Committee, to present the introductory address. Over to you, Mr. Jamal. Thank you, President Puttar. Uh, and I must say, a big thank you to all our panelists who found time for this very important. panel discussion for travel and tourism and i'm deeply grateful on behalf of mc the idea behind this online dialogue with tourism leaders from various nations was to explore how we can work, work together build joint multi-pronged strategies to rebuild tourism intra regional interregional cooperation holds enormous promise for growth in this sector by developing synergy we can promote the vast range of tourism destinations and offerings that asian countries south asian countries and countries as far as as australia have and uh, and how we can promote those destinations and as a part of that i think it also going to help the economic growth social integration and of course employment generation opportunities in these countries the latest figures if i remember correctly when south asia itself would see loss of 50 million jobs and and uh, about 50 billion dollars loss in gdp you know in the south asia region so the devastation is huge post covid travel competition will be huge and it will be critical to enhance regional cooperation collaboration not just to battle the virus but to build back together avoid large scale, avoid large scale discounting ease visa restrictions but to build back together to build back together and deregulate and improve communications and advocacy to policy makers uh, and uh, and for the travelers we believe focus on intra regional travel and sharing lessons learned in simpler informal regional partnerships whether it is intergovernmental or private sector tourism organizations is much easier we are confident to get some brilliant ideas to this end towards the close of this session at the imc chamber of commerce through its travel tourism hospitality committee as the president has rightly said we strongly believe that time is ripe to deliberate on how to build a robust and committed regional tourism action plan that will hopefully provide the much needed ray of hope to travel and tourism industry and pull it out of its present miserable state and provide wings for it to take off sooner than we can imagine and beat all pessimistic predictions of of uh, a gloomy future based on the data forecasts that get churned out week on week month on month and i really hope and believe this is going to come true uh, now i have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panelists in no particular order but ladies first uh, ms rupinder rubar is an indian revenue service officer for 1990 batch she is additional director general for ministry of tourism government of india she is a graduate in modern history from university of delhi she has also done a masters in public administration from lee kuan yew school of public policy in singapore recently she completed degree of law in bombay university and she is enrolled in the masters degree in psychology ms brar is an internal student she also has enrolled uh, she prior to this uh, ministry of tourism assignment she was holding charge as commissioner of large tax payer unit in income tax department in mumbai she attended a lots of training programs in india and overseas to hone her work skills ms brar's interests include reading books of all genres music experiential cooking 
and of course charu card reading ms bar has been awarded finance minister gold medal in law professional training and a full scholarship for the mpa program at the lee kwan uh, institute of institute of, of uh, public policy in singapore so welcome mr Bra ms brar thank you uh, mr sirisupam has been at with the tourism authority of thailand for more than 20 years an extensive experience working in various divisions including international relations europe middle east and africa market regions domestic marketing and policy and planning department prior to his assignment to head the tourism authority of thailand in in, in delhi he was director of southern market division promoting and coordinating thailand southern market in so called domestic market in previous assignments he has been posted to the tourism authority of thailand dubai office as deputy director for middle east since from 2012 to 2016 nishant karshikar uh, welcome mr sirupam mr nishant karshikar is a, has a career as a country manager for india and gulf for tourism australia has a career spanning for two decades spread, spread across marketing and healthcare and nutrition before he shifted gears and became the captain of so called tourism australia he's been responsible for driving visitations and spend and tourism spent by raising australia's awareness and appeal to india under his leadership arrivals from india to australia have more than tripled in uh, last decade to 400000 visit visitors and have been instrumental in strengthening people to people link in within the two countries hailed as a market leader and voted among the top 30 cmos of india by internet mobile association of india in 2019 he is often invited to speak at uh, various seminars and tourism conclaves he is a professional cricketer ladies and gentlemen i am not so sure at what professional level i mean he plays ranji trophy or club level but he plays professional cricket and enjoys his food so he is blessed to have be associated with the country which has got cricket and food going together for himself for themselves miss miss kermali fernando chairperson sri lanka tourism miss kermali fernando is the chairperson of sri lanka tourism heads the government's four tourism entities sri lanka tourism board development authority sri lanka tourism promotion bureau Sri Lanka Conventions Bureau and Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management. This is the first time that one chairperson has been appointed for all four brands. She is the first woman in this role. We are really proud of you, Ms. Fernando, for what you have done. Ms. Fernando is an LLB honours from London School of Economics and, and Political Science and is Barrister of Law at Lincoln's Inn, UK, and an attorney at law in Sri Lanka. She is a life member of the Sri Lanka Bar Association and Law Society of Sri Lanka. Ms. Fernando authored Company Law of Sri Lanka, second edition, a definitive reference for book students for and practitioners of Company Law in Sri Lanka. In recognition of her achievements, she was awarded Professional Woman of the Year in 2007 and a Woman of Achievement for Banking in 2009. Very warm welcome to you, Ms. Fernando. Ms. Mr. Sijit Vijaksono is the Director of Tourism Marketing for East, South and Central Asia, Minister for Tourism and Creative Economy of the Republic of Indonesia. 2020 prior to this he was director of tourism for middle east south and central asia uh, mr sijit is a graduate from university of nagoya in japan and later did his doctorate in international cooperation studies welcome to you mr sijit mr rohit kosla is the executive vice president of ias vinian hotels company limited leads and oversee leads and oversees operations to the, of the north east and west regions Mr Kosla has had various leadership positions within the organization in India, Yemen and Maldives and Sri Lanka. In his current role Rohit looks after a uh, expansive diverse portfolio over 60 hotels, palaces and resorts cutting across brands of Taj, Selections, Vivanta and Expressions. Mr Kosla is an executive committee member of Hotel Association of India and SCOL and also serves as a member of the CI and National Tourism Committee and WTC TTC India Cha India chapter. He is also the chairman for Tata Network Forum for North India. He has been fel felicitated with numerous industry awards, including Young Hotel Manager, General Manager in 2006, uh, General Manager of the Year in 2006 again by the ITM Institute of Hotel Management, and International Achiever of the Year, Year Award by by Pacific Area Travel Writers Association at ITB Berlin in Germany in 2019. Very warm welcome to you, Mr. Kosla. Thank you, Mr. Mandeep Lamba, our moderator today. We are very grateful to him for spending time to moderate the session. Mr Lamba is the president as the president said of of South Asia of HUS and Iraq oversees the practice in the region and is based in New Delhi Mr Lamba is a hospitality professional with an established leadership track record of 35 years in various roles 
national meeting organizations including 17 years as in ceo position mandeep host mandeep lamba has extensive experience in hotel operations development strategy and hospitality advisory having worked for companies such as choice hotels ihg and radisson hotels before becoming president of itc fortune hotels in 2001 mr lamba ventured into entrepreneurial stint for 8 years setting up joint venture companies donaday hotel group uk and onyx hospitality thailand before joining jong les lexal in 2014 as managing director hotel and hospitality group south asia he is also a member of the tourism council of cii north india and a member of the royal institute of chartered surveyors uk recently he was featured in hotelier india's power list as the most respected hotelier in india second year in a row we are very grateful to you mr mr lamba and very warm welcome over to you before i before you start the the panel discussion may i ask mr bhuvnesh khanna ceo of bw communities to say a few words please over to you bhuvnesh uh, and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, bw hotelier and business world are excited to partner with imc chambers of commerce and industry for this wonderful show uh, that they have put together here we have some of the finest minds from the world over region and india who can use their influence good offices and capabilities to help extricate the hospitality travel and tourism industries from the deepest throes of this despair despair one and now despair two that has been thrown at us all not what anyone would have imagined or ordered <clears throat> perhaps one of the latest of, of the hospitality travel and tourism industries perhaps one of the largest employers in the country and in the subcontinent and is highly capital intensive our industry could do with mercy reliefs and god sent kindness in the aftermath of the crisis recovery of tourism in a way that is safe and attractive for tourists and economically viable for the partners will require coordination between countries various ministries industries associations and at a level not seen before for enhancing regional coordination and regaining its lost glory we need to redefine tourism strategies for the future over to you parat and mandeep thank you for having us over as the exclusive media partner thank you uh, thank you thank you bhuvnesh and over to you mandeep thank you farat uh, thank you bhuvnesh um delighted to be here uh in this very very distinguished gathering uh after having uh, heard the introduction of uh, all the panelists uh i am suddenly very nervous um on the on the stature of the people that i am going to be uh, speaking to over the next one hour but regardless i am going to still try uh and get a discussion going uh we're going to try and discuss with this absolutely uh, wonderful uh panel uh on the disruption that covid has caused the travel and tourism industry uh in our part of the world uh and also on strategies um that all of us are seeing in trying to reboot tourism uh and bring it back so um let me start um with our lady guest from our wonderful neighboring destination sri lanka miss fernando um Sri Lanka was sort of not so badly impacted by the covid uh and um, you know it managed to contain it but let's talk about in this first section um about what was it like all of last year uh in 2020 and what measures did you take to sort of keep it contained and what sort of measures did the government take to support the travel and tourism industry thank you thank you Thank you for the invitation. Yes, as you know, Sri Lanka is an island. We have 22 million people. Uh, we've managed it so far, and we don't want to be uh, too, uh, 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 you know, optimistic or arrogant about this because every day things change. But to date, uh, we've done well, and uh, the recovery rate is 96 percent, uh, and the fatality rate is 0.62. So it's pretty low. Uh, we took uh, COVID every patient very seriously. um the pcr testing contact tracing quite a strenuous process was used right from the beginning uh before we had our first uh, first uh, covid patient in sri lanka which happened to be a tour guide 
uh, from the tourism industry uh, who accompanied uh, some Italian tourists. That was our first patient uh, citizen. Uh, in March, before that, we already had a COVID task force set up by the president uh, with multi uh, sort of a multiple uh, sort of cross functional team involved in the forces as well as the medical profession. I was also uh, part of the team. So about 22 odd people were appointed to set up a quarantine center. So long before we had a patient, we were very well prepared. Uh, what was done was we communicated daily to the, uh, the to the community daily twice a day to be honest uh, from the time the first patient was found uh, the moment the first patient was found we went to complete lockdown for six weeks uh, we were questioned criticized uh, debated about that it was too strong but we were glad we did it uh, because that educated also our people uh, as to what this, uh, you know we ourselves got ourselves educated on this uh, uh, the pandemic and uh, immediately what we did was as a government was made sure that people realized and was reassured that there was food security so first we ensured that there was food security online uh, uh, delivery all that we delivered uh, sort of uh, medication everything to people's homes um, and uh, all essential services were allowed to work everything else was closed uh, except uh, agriculture was permitted to continue so that was the first thing and then what we did was we started preparing for we had lots of tourists at that point when we closed so we had about 87,000 tourists we assisted them we coordinated with the airlines with the embassies and what have you and we set up a 24-hour call center so assisted them and then immediately we went into how we could help the industry we helped the industry to a great extent but it's never enough uh, it is never enough because the impact was devastating so the monitoriums were given, time was given to pay the electricity bill, water bills, uh, excise, uh, the liquor license was given time to be paid till next following year. No registration fee, no renewal fee, guides were given a small allowance, drivers were given a small allowance and so on. I think most of the countries have done all that. Then we looked at what other countries are doing, particularly I looked at Singapore and some of the other countries. And then we localized and made a guideline for Sri Lanka, which runs into about 80 pages, covering all the areas of a hotel with this housekeeping. All the areas were covered, travel agencies, guides, uh, restaurants, so on. And we implemented that process actually in June last year. Right. By May, we already opened for domestic tourism. And we implemented a safe and secure certification process. The KPMG and Ernst & Young will uh, audit you. You get a specific QR code for your hotel. And then we opened up the for international visitors uh, uh, January this year, where we opened up about 350 hotels, uh, different range from boutique to five star to four star, two star, one star rest houses as well. So now we are fully operational, tourists are coming in, uh, particularly from uh, the Middle East uh, countries, as well as uh, Russia, Ukraine, you know, CIS countries, as well as the Middle East countries. Middle East because of good flight connectivity. So we have, uh, the, from the guests who have arrived, we have about 11 to 12,000 guests who have arrived for the last few weeks. Uh, we've had less than 1% COVID positive patients. So we have a very detailed protocol in place and a bio bubble concept in place, uh, which has worked right. quite well so far. Right, wonderful. Sigit, <laughs> can I move over to you? Um, Indonesia, of course, is a much, much larger country and uh, it had a serious amount of impact from COVID. I think over 1.5 million cases uh, in Indonesia. So briefly, can you tell us um, what you did last year and uh, what did the government do to sort of support and uh, you know get tourism um, a little settled in the very, very unsettled environment? Thank you very much. First of all, on behalf of the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy of the Republic of Indonesia, I would like uh, once again to highly appreciate this uh, event and uh, I would like to share on the point that you just mentioned yeah. uh, of course as you know that uh, tourism and also the creative economy sector in Indonesia very much uh, suffering because of the pandemic condition uh, that is why uh, during the last year we have done uh, mostly on handling the pandemic. How the Indonesian government handling with the pandemic is the most important factor that uh, has been done in 2020 because this is uh, the uh, 
sub, uh, we, we have been in suffering yeah, for the tourism sector uh, because of this uh, condition and for your information our, we have a new minister at the end of uh, last year and uh, the minister uh, the new the current minister uh, very much uh, concerned on the way we handling the pandemic condition as the, the pre-request side for to revive the sector of tourism uh, including the creative economy and of course uh, yes you can see based on data now the uh, the COVID cases in Indonesia is getting reduced less time by time and the recover number is getting increased day by day and also we focus on uh, destination especially uh, uh, I believe that Indian Indian people know very well about Bali so we focus on uh, Bali the way they handling uh, pandemic especially uh, 2008 because also in consideration if possible if the condition getting better in Bali as our main destination then we will lead to the border opening if possible but with, with the very uh, important condition the way the handling condition of the COVID cases in Bali and we have uh, some uh, uh, also some other things that are very important we do uh, what we call adaptation with CSSE protocol cleanliness health safety and environment sustainability and also in destination covering hotel restaurant and tourist attraction to gain building to uh, build trust yeah for the people uh, to come to visit hotel and also uh, tourist destination and this is not only Bali but uh, apply to all 34 provinces in Indonesia and already started last year within three months we did uh, 5700 certification of CSSE protocol uh, health protocol and right. then we'll continue this April up to June we expect the nation also been implementing this uh, CSSE protocol and of course uh, we'll, we'll, we we also concern very much on the future of the tourism in Indonesia that is why we also uh, do uh, innovation like what we have done we do uh, still maintain our assistance in the market through our communication strategy we have a collaboration as well with our partner online travel agent as well as also uh, with our media partner so that uh, at least little more on, uh, yes talk a little more on rebooting uh, in uh, as we go along further uh, right yes. now i just want to understand how the last year went by and i think you elaborated okay yeah so okay and, and before i go further just a quick housekeeping announcement that we will be taking some questions uh, at the end of this discussion so if anybody would like to ask a question to any of the panelists please just put it on the chat box uh, and we'll pick it from there okay moving on uh, kun vachira uh, chai you know you know that uh, thailand is our favorite destination uh, and it impacts us equally as it impacts you that uh, we can't travel to Thailand. Uh, but you have done uh, a remarkable job on uh, keeping COVID very controlled uh, with very, very low number of deaths, uh, almost in double digits. Um, that's been a remarkable task. But you obviously have a very significant tourism economy uh, 40 billion uh, arrivals and 65 billion dollars coming in. Uh, so, how have you dealt with this in the previous year and what kind of support has the government provided um, in the last year when the pandemic broke out? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I just try to be brief and, and quick on this, but first, 
I have to say thank you very much. Uh, for now, we need to position Thailand as the favorite and trusted destinations. So it's not only favorite, but you know, people have to have confidence in us when they be able to travel as well, right? Looking back last year, okay, um, as you say, Thailand have done quite well. Okay, we have a very stringent measures. Um, 14 days quarantines and real screenings of people coming in. But again, I need to quote uh, what Miss Fernando have says. Situation is changing, and it's very difficult to predict. You know, Thailand have actually Thailand is one of the country outside China, which we see the case since last year in February. We done it well. You know, domestic tourism is back to normal. Start from May June. Then we see the second wave. Unfortunately, in December, when everyone is expecting to celebrate the New Year, the second wave is coming in. Then we we did uh, another stringent measures to control things getting better. But now I have to say that is the third wave in the countries. Uh, we try our best to control. What is good about Thailand? I think is that the people are quite responsible, and we doing a very systematic in terms of trace and tracking. So, so now is we hope things are getting better in Thailand very soon. So this is the situation. Back in terms of tourism, um, in short, okay, as you say, the numbers, tourism regarding nearly 20% of our GDP, direct and indirect. So that's huge, and it's really you know, it's not just tourism industry, so it's affecting other related as well. So we need to what we have been doing in the past is like supporting incentive. Uh, during the we did our lockdown as well last year. Uh, very important is about the skill, you know, our tourism personnel that we have been done. A lot of uh, supporting to save the cost of the um, tourists. First thing first is that when the situation is getting bad, we do the boosting of domestic tourism first, and then we start to prepare to welcome back the international tourism. So last last year we still continue to work. In terms of international market, like you know, in in terms of like uh, creating Thailand to be as the top of my destinations, but we do it in a sentimental way, not too much, but not too low. So this is what we have been done uh, briefly for last year. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kun uh, Vachirachai. Uh, Nishan, Australia has been sort of like the poster boy, poster girl. During COVID, on handling of COVID, and the cases were sort of very controlled. You managed to keep it less than 30,000, I think, is the number, 29,000 odd uh, till now. And uh, obviously, it's uh, one of the lowest uh, population density countries in the world, and that helps because social distancing happens by accident, uh, and you don't necessarily need to force anyone to do it. But still, having said that, uh, I think it was a remarkable uh, manner in which the country managed itself, along with, of course, your neighbors in New Zealand. So, tell us a little bit about um, how was 2020 and what sort of steps did the government take to support the industry? All right. I guess uh, first and foremost, a big thank you uh, to IMC for organizing this, and uh, it's an absolute honor and privilege to be a part of this elite panel. To answer your question on. The initiatives undertaken by the Australian government during the last 12 months, I guess, if there's one Western country that has managed the pandemic really well, uh, that country is Australia. And as you rightly said, you know, there are just less than around 29,000 cases over the past one year in Australia. And uh, the point to note that is that uh, because of the discipline and the efforts of the government, both the federal government and the state government, uh, over the past 30 days, there have been literally zero cases in Sydney and Melbourne due to community transmission. In fact, uh, in the city of Perth or the state of Western Australia, the last case that they had seen due to community transmission was on April 11, 2020. So it's been almost a year since they have not had a single case, single new case due to community transmission in Australia. So it's a phenomenal uh, achievement, I must say. And as you again rightly said, social distancing naturally happens in Australia because a country with just a population of 25 million, uh, two and a half times the size of uh, two and a half times the size of India, with a population of just India, uh, with a population of just Mumbai or Delhi, I guess it gets uh, far more easier to control the pandemic than possibly some of uh, you know uh, our countries, uh, for that for that matter. Now, as we speak, everything's open in Australia. Uh, 
Tourism Australia has launched a campaign called Holiday Year this year to promote domestic tourism. We have launched a campaign called Event Year this year to promote events in Australia. And uh, I guess what has helped us to control the situation and ensure that there are zero COVID cases or rather COVID, achieving a COVID free status has been extensive surveillance, testing, contact, trace, contact tracing, supportive institutional quarantine and compassionate care. I guess it's a combination of all these things that have helped us to, to achieve that zero COVID status uh, over the past few months or so. Now, Australia is gradually opening its borders. They're extremely cautious in terms of opening off its borders. On this weekend, they're going to open their borders, the Trans-Tasman borders to New Zealanders. So Australians can travel to New Zealand, New Zealanders can travel to Australia without a vaccine, without a negative RT-PCR test or without the need to be vaccinated. And that's a great achievement because both Australia and New Zealand have relatively seen zero COVID cases over the past few, past few months or so. In terms of the initiatives undertaken by the Australian government to support the tourism uh, industry, I guess it's been a monumental effort. There was almost close to $46 billion worth of direct government spending for tourism recovery. And let me just take you across various elements of travel. So on the visa front, uh, the Department of Home Affairs has already announced that they'll be waiving off the visa application charge for everyone for every applicant who was holding a valid visa and was intending to travel to Australia between March 2020, as soon as the lockdown started, and whose visa visas are going to expire by, say, December 2022. So all you need to do is reapply for your visa, your VAC charges, the visa application charges would be waived off, and then uh, you, know, you would be able to travel to Australia without paying any visa application charge. For the airline, for the national carrier, the government initially announced a direct grant of almost $800 million. That's almost 4,000 crore uh, in, in, in rupees that was offered to Qantas. Recently, there's a campaign called Half Price Airfares, uh, and where the government is providing tickets, airline tickets at 50% of the price to almost over 800,000 individuals so that they can travel domestically within, within Australia. For the travel agent fraternity, they've launched a $130 million program providing grants uh, depending on the size of size and volume of the business of various travel agents, the inbound tour operators and the wholesalers. For the business events or the MICE community, you know, as we, as we call it in India, there's a $50 million exhibitor grant program. Another interesting initiative undertaken by Tourism Australia is a program called National Experience Content Initiative, wherein almost 1,800 tourism products are able to now develop their brochures, their digital content, their images, their videos, and this will be completely taken care of by Tourism Australia. So supporting almost 1800 products and experiences uh, is, is what uh, you know Tourism Australia is currently doing. There's also a voucher scheme which was announced. So every uh, individual citizen or rather there was fixed amount of vouchers uh, which were allocated by the various states. So there were $100 and $200 vouchers which could be redeemed on your hotel stay, on your restaurant dining, on your holidays that you could, you know, that, that you could redeem. And lastly, most importantly, there's a $40 million fund that was created for the indigenous uh, you know, tourism community just to support the, support the local community. So they haven't, they have literally covered every aspect of travel. And, and, and that's the reason, you know, it's uh, the country is definitely back on its growth track and, and hopefully uh, likely to open its borders to other countries who, who declare themselves COVID free or maybe are able to travel with a proper vaccine. Very interesting, Ishan. Having uh, now traversed the region with all our uh, overseas guests, we will head back home uh, to Miss Brar. And uh, ma'am, tell us a little bit uh, about what the government did here. We were obviously fairly uh, impacted, uh, but I think we dealt very well with the first phase of the pandemic, given that we had limited infrastructure and um, you know we have a fairly large population. Uh, we sort of managed to do uh, well in the first phase and uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how the government, um, you know, supported the travel and tourism industry. Thank you, Mandeep, and thank you, IMC. And um, I think it's just almost juxtaposing after Australia in, in, in a sense, a study in contrast. <laughs> and whether we talk of social distancing or whether we talk of any other aspects, so it's, so it's interesting that one is speaking after Australia. Uh, yes, it has been uh, very, very challenging given the, the size of the country, given this, the, the diversity 
and the entire uh, socio-economic uh, spectrum that we have in India and the topography, everything, everything just makes it so much more challenging. And also an early understanding that perhaps we may be just about spared, but that of course turned into a despair when the first uh, traveler came in from Italy and there was a growing understanding that here we are when we're facing something unprecedented, that it was going to be so unprecedented, I don't think anybody was even looking at it in that sense, if we look back in late February or early March. Yes, and therefore the most uh, critical first thing was to make sure that everybody was safe. And I think the most uh, you know interesting learning at that point for all of us and uh, considering that that was also a period when India does get a lot of foreign tourists. Typically from October to March is when we get a lot of foreign travellers. So there were still a lot of people in India at the time when lockdowns um, were announced. And therefore the first most important challenge was to make sure that everybody who was spread out all over the country needed to be kept safe and needed to be sent back to their homes if they so choose to do. And if they did want to stay back in India and extend their visas and extending that kind of support and creating a, an emotional comfort when you are away from home was the most uh, primary thing to do for us in tourism. And we set up something called the Stranded in India and we look back upon it as a success story in the sense that everybody who was out of their homes and traveling in our country found support mechanisms through that platform and went back home and then there were some who actually chose to stay back here saying that it was they felt safer to be in India than to be traveling to some parts of Europe because Europe was reeling at that point of time. But uh, at the same time was also the immense distress that was visible in the entire industry with travel stopping entirely for a nation where we have direct and indirect employment almost close to 13% coming from tourism and hospitality it is uh, it is a tough tough journey and i'm i'm using the word is and not just was because uh, as we talk and uh, and we heard our friend from thailand they've been through the second and the third wave now and currently as i talk here we are perhaps witnessing also something i don't know whether to call it the second or the third wave but clearly a second wave and uh, so the last year the calibrated understanding of how much do we need to unlock down and where has also been a matter of great challenge given the size and the diversity of the country. So we kept talking to state governments, we started talking to the provinces, started talking to the trade and it was always a tough bullet to bite so to say because you know you need to create jobs, you know you need to open the sector but there is just no point in going two steps ahead and three steps back. So it's, it's right. a really, really a cracker of a year, if we may call it, because we did try to harmonize the protocols as time went by and domestic tourism started showing a fledgling growth somewhere in late September, early October with the road travel and nearby travel picking up and people actually heading out in campus, people actually choosing to work from, not from home, but work from mountains and heading to Uttarakhand and Himachal, the northern parts of India, which are closer to the Himalayas. So, so that kind of uh, reopening and also an understanding on our part that whereas one way to support the industry is to give direct support, but the other way to do is to create demand. And that's where the good part of India seemingly uh, is there and uh, the, the size of the domestic market. And given the fact that most Indians are also not able to travel out of India currently with most countries still not uh, letting inbound travel really happen is a huge opportunity, is something that was pretty clear early on. And uh, it's, it's really heartening to see that in many parts of India, the domestic travel has truly kicked it. I just got back from Kashmir yesterday and it was tough getting rooms even for us and so we had to spread out over four hotels in, in Srinagar itself. All hotels from Pehalgam reporting Chocoblog, Gulmag reporting Chocoblog and that's music to the ears. 
if you look at northeastern parts of india if you look at um, a lot of uh, lodges around the sanctuaries the wildlife parks so working on the i think the domestic part of tourism has been an important part of strategic uh, i wouldn't say a paradigm shift but a recognition of a vertical that was so potential and something that we were perhaps not working with so much strategy but letting it grow more organically so i think that's been one uh, important working last year in terms of direct support i wish i had as much to say as nisham did but uh, but yes the msme definitions have included tourism and hospitality and we are trying to create more outreach for that because there is perhaps not enough information the eclgs has tried to help the mid and the larger uh, corporates that had loan liabilities on them but yes as uh, my friend from sri lanka said you know how much work the government may do on this front the the impact uh-huh. of the pandemic has been so immense so immense that it is going to take a while for us to you know sort of work on it and at the same time the review of when should visas be opened we've been having a discussion almost every month with the ministry of home and external affairs as i said it is very tempting and the moment the numbers started going down a bit it was very tempting that should we just go ahead and open but the cost benefit analysis of doing anything which would then required to be taken back showed us that no it made no sense unless we were very sure that we were able to beat the pandemic not only for ourselves but also for anybody who comes from another country and that kind of confidence went missing because of the brazilian strain and the uk strain and in some senses we are perhaps witnessing a research because of the kind of spread that is happening now from from whatever that we have uh, figured out from the health ministry is that the spread of this virus is far more in terms of the speed at which it actually transmits so yes i think time still to be very very cautious very very careful domestic travel is kind of sort of holding us and it is holding us more in the non metro cities naturally because it's not the large events the large exhibitions that cannot happen for now but the smaller properties the boutique hotels the home stays they have been witnessing a good demand uh, away from the metros um, the small places outside mumbai the lonavlas and the karjats have all been showing good demand similarly out of bangalore but but time right. to be extremely careful extremely cautious and and i think we will uh, wait and watch on how to really take everything forward so you're you're so right domestic tourism has been the knight in shining armor uh, and that's the one i think which will see us through if at all uh, thankfully we have a very very large domestic tourism travel uh, numbers so um, i'm going to move to you rohit and i'm not coming to you the last for any specific reason it's just that uh, we've been so battered and bruised we've lost our voice you're probably the last man standing so we <laughs> we're going to speak to you to tell us about hospitality and uh, how did ihcl sort of uh, cope up with it and, and how did the industry deal with uh, what i think is the most devastating event in the history of uh, hotels and hospitality first of all thank you very much uh, thank you mr jamal and i am c for having me here and thank you mandeep i want to start by you know everybody's talking you know bad news bad news so i think we've been through a nice festive period and everybody in the on on the panel here has has something to celebrate in the last we got 10 days so a uh, happy sankran uh, to uh, mr sri sampan and uh, and uh, and uh, besak uh, and uh, besakhi to you uh, mandeep and uh, ramadan karim to uh, mr jamal and uh, uh, shubh avrudu aluth veva to ms manand thank you uh, it's a, it's a, it's a time of celebration also so i want to uh, twist this a little bit because uh, you know uh, i know we are in a very serious situation but uh, we need to have be cautiously optimistic about the future and i think as an organization that is what we looked at um uh, there was bad news all around and uh, and uh, we believed in uh, in a simple saying that with every crisis there is an opportunity uh, so we try to see that what can we do in a situation where things are locking down travel is is getting restricted and and how can we make do business when none exists so it basically meant a re looking at uh, at the book and uh, 
and going back to school but unfortunately going back to school doesn't work because nobody in college ever taught us how to make money when your top line is zero uh, so the top line was zero for everybody so in the business it was a very difficult situation obviously we looked at our costs and we looked at uh, how we can drive top line through various um, um, initiatives uh, the point i'm trying to make here is that when things are down and out one needs to you know positively look at what can we do to survive and i think as as an industry the first thing that we did was to come together so i must say and i must compliment uh, the entire colleagues in the industry uh, whether it was under the aegis of cii or whether it was under the aegis of uh, hotel association of india or wtc or faith everybody just came together and had a common voice which was something that was missing in our industry for many many years and and that allowed us to have a common set agenda you know of course three or four priorities that we wanted the government to address for us and working along with the government uh, helped us in this manner because rather than having disparate set of requirements we had very focused set of requirements and i think like ms brar said the msme um, um benefit that was given to us in terms of moratoriums that helped in certain states uh, we got industry stages that helped us on uh, on electricity and utility bills in certain states we got uh, waivers on property taxes and on extension of uh, license fees uh, waivers uh, force majeure clauses coming in so there was a lot of participation between public and private and i think in a crisis coming together and having a common agenda is what helped the industry coming to our organization ihcl uh, we very quickly realized that this was something that we never seen before and nobody really had the answers so we we came up with a strategy called reset uh, and uh, reset was a strategy that basically looked at uh, revenue streams uh, and driving top line at at the time of this uh, looking at excellence and uh, safety being a very important thing at this point of time uh, with covid and traveler confidence quite shaken that was important uh, spend optimization looking at your variable fixed costs was important uh, effective asset uh, management and that was also very important and thrift and financial tools because ultimately you know like ms broad mentioned about 12 to 13% of the direct or indirect workforce in 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 our country is related to travel and tourism and and therefore we have a responsibility towards them and to towards the community so we worked on the reset strategy as as an organization and i think uh, uh, together as a team uh, we came up with a lot of creative and innovative ideas but the first and most important focus was on safety and i think uh, that is something that is that is i i could hear from everybody uh, you know there are certifications in sri lanka there are certifications in in indonesia uh, there are certifications in thailand now i think luckily um, australia doesn't need certification uh, because they are all safe anyway so so there were there, there there are certifications also available in india which the government had had launched and we are all participating in that uh, safety is very critical and we launched something called tajness a commitment we strengthened which was on the four pillars of you know of uh, sanitization hygiene uh, physical distancing and i say physical distancing because in our industry if we say social distancing will be shut forever so our, our industry is a social industry the hospitality and tourism industry so physical distancing yes uh, uh, we we focused on that and also on uh, the usage of pers- personal protective equipment Uh, you know just having a policy was not good enough you know you need somebody to enforce it so we had something called the covid marshal app in our properties or across where uh, people were going around who were trained and were recording any uh, anybody who was not really uh, you know following the covid guidelines whether they were staff or whether they were guests so this helped us to kind of keep um, keep the pandemic at bay however uh, we also saw what ms brar mentioned and i am sure that uh, ms manalo also uh, noticed that in sri lanka where we have a, we have three hotels uh, that there was a new travel that started in domestic travel which was you know leisure and pleasure travel and i think that is something that uh, a new word called pleasure and that was people were sitting in a, in a, in, a, in a nice uh, resort in in thyog in simla or they were sitting in rishikesh on the banks of the river ganges and they were actually working out of there uh, remotely 
so the family was taken care of everybody was away from the pandemic they were out in the fresh air open air and were still they were connected to work i think the whole role that technology play, played in this pandemic to connect everybody helped us with starting this new business which is the pleasure business that we have staycations became another very important uh, way in which we started regaining business because uh, people were sick and tired of being in their houses and they wanted to just get a break and then they moved into hotels so like ms brad said leisure hotels did very well but city hotels are a challenge because you know uh, what do you do in a city so staycations is what we launched the point i'm trying to make is that in every crisis there will be some opportunity and if we are positively searching for that opportunity i think we can find business uh, um, uh, we have to stick to the basics we have to ensure that we stick to our values we we have to be uh, we have to ensure uh, complete stakeholder management and take everybody together in the end we are a private business enterprise and we are committed to our uh, shareholders and our stakeholders and therefore in order to come up and out of this crisis was a top priority for us and i think we did a reasonably good job in the first phase the second uh, wave is on and that has created uh, obviously a lot more uh, complication today the speed at which it has spread the rate uh, at which it is uh, you know the infections are going up it is a cause of concern uh, a lockdown temporary partial night curfews uh, put up a little bit of a cough uh, and and i can i can i can i can imagine but that is very important we totally support the government because at this point of time the safety of the citizens is paramount and uh, and we as industry uh, work hand in hand with the government to ensure that this pandemic is put to uh, put to bay so um, in conclusion we are uh, cautious but we are also optimistic